Welcome to It's Art, Let's Talk About It, a podcast sponsored by the Museum of Western Art in Kerrville, Texas. Located in the heart of the Texas Hill Country, the museum is dedicated to the preservation and promotion of the American West, especially through the art of the West. In this podcast series, we will visit with artists, art collectors, and gallery directors working in the Western art genre. We'll talk about the history and heritage of Western art, and we'll talk about why talking about Western art is so important. I'm Daryl Beecham, the executive director of the museum, and I'll be your host for It's Art. Let's talk about it. The podcast is a member of the Texas Hill Country Podcast Network. In this episode of It's Art, Let's Talk About It, we visit with sculptor-turned-painter Herman Walker. We visit with him about his early days as a sculptor, his involvement in the business of casting a bronze, running a gallery, and how his love of the West Texas cattle culture turned into his career as a well-known painter of the American Cowboy. We visit about his attention to detail and his tight approach to painting cowboys, horses, and the Texas landscape. On this episode of It's Art, let's talk about it. We're joined by our good friend Herman Walker. And Herman, we were talking the other day about doing this, and I think I saw fear in your eyes. It was one of those weird kind of moments. We talk about art all the time. Why does putting a microphone in somebody make it more difficult? Just not that much of a, I don't know, a broadcast type person. You got a face made for radio, though, man. Come on. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Hide out and speak through the cracks. Seriously, though, it is just a conversation about something that we both enjoy, both uh, love. Uh, You make your living at it as well. I guess we both do. But art is something that uh, it's really a strange medium in that we... We depend on a lot of other people to make a living, and you've been doing this for a very long time. Let's talk about how you got started. Where did you get your start in the art? Were you one of those Jack Sorensen kids drawing at at age three, and you knew that's what you were always going to do? I dabbled in it a little bit uh, from the time I was six or seven years old, and I did a lot of little, of course, typical kiddo little boy stuff when Korean War was still going on and so we drew jet planes fighting each other and that sort of thing and that was but you know not really a definite pursuit in it that was just not I didn't have I spent a lot of my time outside and I grew up on a ranch so there were more interesting things to do down at the horse barn than it was sitting around sketching but I did do some but no not my real start <clears throat> in all seriousness was I was I took an elective in 1968 when I was a senior at, at Texas Tech. I majored in animal science, and I took an elective and took an introductory sculpture course by a guy named John Queen who just turned lights on for me and really got me interested in doing sculpture. And he, he told me, he said, you need to learn the lost wax casting method we were casting in aluminum just carving styrofoam and burying it in the sand and pouring hot aluminum on it it's a very rough textured loose type media but being young and naive i didn't i really didn't know so i just started doing research in libraries and sneaked in the back door foundries where i could and learned the techniques i that was all started in 68, and 1973, I cast my first bronze, and 72 and 73, I had a bunch of explosions and that sort of thing <laughs> and learning the process. But, but you're known today as a painter, though. I am. But you got your start with Dr. McQueen as a, as a sculptor. As a sculptor, that's right. In, 19, in the early 70s. In the early 70s. I did that and stayed with the... I was in the manufacturing business and worked with a guy, and we made a lot of neat stuff and a lot of neat innovations were coming along in technology of the woodworking industry. I had a good job with him, and I stayed with that. And Finally, in 74, we, at the end, I decided it was time to to try if I was going to do the sculpture thing. I, I sent some, I did some pieces, and the first five or six pieces, I had a next-door neighbor who had kiddos in Jackson, Wyoming, and so he said, let me take some of your sculpture up there and see if I can sell it. I took it. He took it up there, and the guy 
was excited about it and sold all my work. And I had another fellow that he knew in Albuquerque, and they were selling everything I'd send to them. So I thought this this might be. It's easy. There's nothing to do. It's exciting, yeah, <laughs> to be able to do what is interesting to me. And so we looked at Santa Fe and we looked at Taos and Fredericksburg and Kerrville and decided to move here to Kerrville. At that time, there really wasn't that much of an art community here, but... That even predates the Museum of Western Art, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, 83, so that was yeah. 73. It was 10 years ahead of that. But it, we decided because of the schools and wanting our kiddos to get a good education, we would go with Kerrville. So we moved here and opened a foundry and a gift shop and a gallery and ran that for five years. And during that time, I started doing some pencil drawings and colored pencil and moved into watercolor and started doing oils as well as doing my sculpture and traveling all over the country. And because I was gone so much, uh, we decided we would move back to the ranch country and up at El Dorado and there's Sonora and El Dorado and get up there and get close to my wife's folks and my folks so that when I was gone, she'd have a backup in case she needed help with the kids. And at that time, of course, most artists were doing this. You had to show at least once a month. I was doing 12, 14 shows a year and on the road a lot. And you'd paint and go to a show and, and or get ready with sculpture or whatever. And I was doing both at the time. And then get back home and prep and then go to another show. And that just went on year round. And so it was an exciting time. And the mid to mid 70s to the mid 80s was just the Western art field was on fire. There was just a lot going on. And it was an exciting time. And I saw my artwork and my audience for my artwork grow. And it really was a great time and got to show with some of the best and some of the various Western art shows that were invitational. Back in those days, you didn't submit so much to the shows or apply. They just took you by invitation. They would invite you if you were met the criteria they wanted. And I was fortunate enough to get in with some really, some of the big boys and, and some of the biggest shows going around in the country and just very fortunate in that regard. Who were your early influences? Tom Ryan, probably. That's a good one. Was a real mentor to me. He offered me a lot of advice on how to how to approach what I was doing. And the first time I asked him about taking what I was doing, he'd say, "You're not quite quite ready, but you're getting there." So, <laughs> like so many of us, as we go through life, we find that uh, the best experience is just by doing it. Yeah. and doing lots and lots of it, and that's the way I learned. And I, not having any formal training, it was pretty much what I gathered from different artists just picked up, and then the experimentation on my own. That, that started at the first. When I first started learning how to do sculpture, I just had to, had to wing it and learn a lot of it and pick a lot of it up from just talk to different, to different artists and different foundry people and so forth about it processes and improving my work as I went along. We're joined today by, on It's Art, let's talk about it, by the uh, painter, early sculptor, Herman Walker, and a good friend of the Museum of Western Art here in Kerrville, Texas. And you moved to Kerrville in the early 70s, predate the museum by even 10 years, had a gallery here in Kerrville, a foundry, if I understand correctly? Yes, I did my work and other people's work, too. Talk about that experience. Is that Part of becoming a better artist is knowing how to create the, uh, the that, art, or was it a nightmare? No, it was, of course, <clears throat> to uh, give a little bit of background about my mental thinking on that. When I was in a manufacturing company, I worked from, oh, as few as six, but as many as 24 people, and I had two different shifts, and that's basically why I got out of it. I was working, I had 16-hour 16 hours of folks coming and going and it was just I did not want to go down that avenue again I set my foundry up and designed it so I could do everything by myself and so I cast by myself and as a result I I could control pretty much I didn't have anybody to blame but myself when something went wrong and and I had a little more quality control to do than I did if I were working 
other people. But I was fortunate in that in this part of the country there weren't any foundries. As soon as word got out, I started picking up people and uh, doing other artists' work as well as my own. I did, we, we here are familiar with Bob Gulick from San sure. Antonio. And I cast Bob Gulick's first piece. We did a, had a turkey piece. Bob came out and part, camped in my parking lot and we cranked out his first turkey piece that he had ever done. And so that was interesting. And I had some other artists, Austin area and San Antonio area. What kind of brought my perspective of how big it could get if I wanted to do that and just pursue the foundry aspect of it. G. Harvey's dad came into the gallery one day and he had a little mule and they were doing an edition of 1500, I believe it was, wow. of, of these uh, <laughs> little prints. And they wanted to do a little accompanying mule to go with that. And he said, I said, yes, sir, we can do that for you. And he said, I'd like to get 500 to begin with. And I said, okay, what's your time framework on that? And he said, oh, this month, and then we want to do the, the other 1,000 in the next couple of two or three months. And I, I said, I'm just the one man show here. I can't, there's no way I can do that. So I got him hooked up with a foundry in Houston. And But that was probably my biggest awakening of what the potential was in that. And we had some, some chats around the breakfast table about which way we were going to go and what we were going to do. And at the same time, my art career was taking off and doing quite well. I had to make a choice on what I wanted to do. We sold the foundry and sold the business and moved back up to get close to the folks so I could start doing fully traveling and spending my time. And, of course, I gathered material up there. I do cowboy art. This way I could be close to the ranch people and the cowboy art and do that. And Does that, that's, that was in 78 when we moved back up there. We were here five years and had a good run, but needed to get back to get back to that ranch country so I could be able to travel and pursue my art. You've there. talked about breakfast chats, and you say, you say we, but you're talking about Deanne. Yes, my wife and I. The, she's the lovely Deanne Walker, and you guys have been together for a number of years now. Let's, 57. 57, only 57 <laughs> years, right? <laughs> What's well, a few years she's, between friends, right? She's a pretty good breakfast chat chat person to have around yeah she's, so you guys moved she, moved from Kerrville in 78 and we're uh, in the El Dorado area how long we lived there until 2008 we were there 30 years 30 years yeah. before you came back to Kerrville before so we it's came been back to Kerrville. El Dorado Kerrville El Dorado now Kerrville now, basically the now two Kerrville again <laughs> now Kerrville again for the for the next 30 years yeah I really experiment a lot, yeah. <laughs> but you talk about going from sculpting 3D, sculpting to painting. At what point did you decide and you settle on oil as your medium and, and cowboy art? The cowboy art part of it was, that was from the word go. That was something I, that, there was never a doubt about what I wanted to do and how, what I wanted to pursue with my artwork. I'm my my grandfather was a rancher, my dad was a rancher all his life, and I thought I was going to be a rancher. And the ranch life is something I've always tried to portray, and regardless whether it's sculpture or, or painting. And the, the time factor and the cost involved in sculpture makes it something that is somewhat prohibitive in the sense that it's a, you don't just, we've got a show next week and we have to have something, so you don't yeah. just. You, you can't just put a frame on it. You just you can't just say well this yeah. sculpture appears because it's the process is a thirty day process regardless of how hard you try or how fast you cannot you can't speed that up not with lost wax I had to have something that I could do in the midst of all this planning that would give me an opportunity to make some income on the side I started doing sketching and painting and watercolor was very good to me and I really enjoyed doing that and. I did not do, I approached the watercolor not wet on wet. I did more dry brush watercolors. When I started experimenting with oils, I found that they were much more conducive to what I was trying to do in the, in the detail and the tightness that I was wanting to do. And watercolors have a tendency to be a little looser and you can get the same vibrancy and color and everything, but you have to, it's quite a bit more 
watercolor is less forgiving than oil is. <laughs> <laughs> so For those of you interested in looking at Herman Walker's work, we'll post some of it on our website on the podcast page. But people can also go out to HermanWalker.com. No, is that Herman? Well, that's right. Is it Herman Walker Art or Herman Art Walker? Just HermanWalker.com. HermanWalker.com and see, see or, the works. Or you can just Google Herman Walker Artist and it'll come up. So people can, they can play along. Some A lot of people like to listen to the podcast and they'll play along, go out and look at the art that we're talking about. You tend to paint in a, a very tight style. Realism, it's not photorealism. It's not, it doesn't go that far. But is that what you seem to enjoy is the tighter, more detailed looks? Yeah, I enjoy that part of it because... <clears throat> the the tack the gear the, the 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 cowboys themselves to me that's if you, if you if you get something wrong a cowboy will be real quick to point it out to you that you don't have your gear right you don't have your tack on that horse and so as a consequence of that I don't know it just developed that I, I like the tighter style and I was I've always admired people who did stuff is a lot tighter than mine and so it's just I'm, I've never been too much on the impressionism aspect of it even though the the feeling is what you're after to me there's a symbiosis between the cowboy and the animals and the land and as I paint I try to collect all of that together that tells a story about a specific area a specific time and just a, the moment uh, encapsulating all of those the environment and the land and the animals and as well as the people that uh, form the ranch country I, to me that's the, the essence of what I'm trying to say is tell a story of, of the magnetism that uh, people find in in uh, being out west and, and so it's that's just uh, it's just what I'm trying to try to do talk about your regular painting day do you paint six hours a day no no <laughs> try to i generally will paint four yeah four to six but very rarely more than that i'll generally do you consider yourself a, a fast painter or a slow painter no, i'm a slow painter and i'm not very fast but sometimes when when you're either faced with deadlines or more specifically sometimes when i get one that i really feel is going good i might spend Dan will say, it's time, to, it's time to quit. I'll say, I'll be there in a little bit. And Three hours go by. And you're <laughs> yeah, and it's, I started at 10 in the morning, and I'm not a quick starter, <laughs> but I start at 9.30 or 10 in the morning, and then sometimes I'll be still going at it at 7 at night or 8. And if I'm really excited about doing something and trying to grasp that feeling and hang on to that feeling that's, that's uh, being expressed, then I will put in the long hours and the extra hours. When I was younger, I would do it. Lots of times you'd be gone to a show, and then you had 30 days to produce five or six paintings, and that meant some all-nighters. And, of course, I was back in my college days. We did a lot of all-nighters and, yeah. and uh, studying, so that kind of sacrifice time was, when I was younger, it was not a big deal, but at my age, it's a big deal. <laughs> I go to sleep at the easel if I try to do that kind of all-night stuff anymore. But How many pieces do you work on at once? Uh, one at a time. One at a time. I don't ever, I don't do the gang thing. I can't, my mind's not sharp enough. We interviewed recently Billy Shank, and he's got five or six going at once sometimes. It just and, blows my mind. And people who do that, when I ask other artists, because we do a lot of interviews, and they all talk about, uh, it's just it's different between artists, right? You've got to yeah. find your own rhythm. And so you've got three works in the the current exhibition, the 40th Roundup exhibition and sale. And congratulations, you sold all three of them and recently sold all three out in uh, the trappings out at the Big Ben Museum of the Big Ben. Yeah, the Lord's blessed. It was, that was unbelievable. It was great. So you sold six works in, in just a matter of two weeks there. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> Took a little more than two weeks to produce them, but yeah. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Yeah, that's and that's part of it. People don't think about the, the time commitment that that goes on. How long have you been partic uh, participating in art shows? Since the beginning, pretty much, yeah. I guess the first shows I went to was, oh, maybe uh, maybe I'd been doing it a year, a year and a half, and then I started doing shows. I had a elderly gentleman that was a friend that lived here, and he said, 
you need to go and paint uh, down San Antonio on the River Walk and uh, go to that show. I don't remember what the name of the show was, but it was a, a, sh- a show where it was an outdoor event down on the River Walk, and uh, that was murder. I, that was not. I, I found out real quick that was not for me because even though there were probably twenty-five or thirty thousand at least people that came through over a two-day period there. Nine of nine out of ten were like jets taking off. They just going by you so fast. Yeah. <laughs> and there, and of course the heat and the bugs and the just the just the magnitude of all of those people and trying to get them to slow down long enough to look at what you got. I I told him I said no, nah, Mr. Stewart, that's not for me. <laughs> I'm not tough enough for that. But there was a lot of guys that t- did that we know, Mondo. Pena and Hinojosa and some of those guys that did that for years and became very successful at it. But that just not wasn't my bailiwick. So I started going and found out that there were a lot of charity-type shows. And back in those days, a lot of them would be to a particular charity with a benefit for a show. And they would have local business people put together a show. And it might be at a civic center or someplace like that. And they'd put up panels and sail and they were but they were indoors and you already had the panels and everything set up for you all you had to do is bring your artwork and and so that was my start on that and then I got in some of the bigger shows that were they were benefits for major recipients and and those were a lot of a lot more noteworthy artists that were in them and they sold big bucks and so it was the mid 70s to the mid 80s was just a kind of a crazy time because they, a lot of the shows where they were invitational type shows, they'd close the doors and make everybody stay outside and then they'd open the doors and it was like a Penny or Sears. White sale, huh? White sale. They'd yeah. open the doors and people would be running and grabbing. And, I remember those in the early days of the cowboy artist. They'd yeah, shut the doors and you had to rush in. Yeah. It was great and crazy, but you don't, you just never knew what was going to happen. But a lot of the shows, like I say, that in the, the Western art field really enjoyed a charismatic time along there. That was I haven't experienced since that time. Now it's not not so wild and crazy. You were involved in Kerrville in the early '70s, predating the Museum of Western Art, or I'm sorry, the Cowboy Artist of America Museum. But then when you moved back to Kerrville, the museum had already been going in a couple of years at that point. Do you remember when you first started getting involved with the Museum of Western Art? Yeah, when we came back here in 2008, and I'm trying to think, I believe it was 2010 was the first time I participated in a show. Might have been later than that, but I'm not real clear on that. But yeah, I became aware of it. And when I was, I was torn when we came back here because in the mid 70s, I was on the board of directors and very active with the Hill Country Arts Foundation out at at Ingram. And they did some, at that time, they were doing some tremendous workshops and that sort of thing and had just a tremendous summer art program that was really great. And I was involved in that, trying to help them grow and get a base and stay, get stable. And at first, when we first came back here, I thought I'll try to work through that. But like all things, it's the framework. They're still doing great things. Oh, they are, and they do wonderful things every day. But it had changed, and it just there weren't the same people and quite the same mindset that I wanted to do and was familiar in doing with my artwork. You started helping. a good friend of ours, uh, he's now passed on, Hans Poppy, here at the museum. I did. About that same time. That's really how you I, got started. Yeah, I, I did. I started doing some just coming out. And, and it was coffee time, basically, to begin with, and just drinking coffee and visiting and talking about different things that happened or were happening in the art world and just enjoyed the fellowship of... Uh, of being around Hans because Hans had so many wonderful stories about his experiences through the years of dealing with different shows and going all over the country with with the CA and that was started and I I told him I said do you ever need any help well I'll be happy to help you it got word he'd say I'm gonna hang a hang a new exhibit if you want to come help and and Hans had a (laughs) you had to know Hans he was a great big guy but he was 
he, he was really a fine fellow. He was one who was not afraid to express his... He scared the water out of me the first time I ever met him. He's a young professional <laughs> coming into the museum, and, and yeah. Hans was, was uh, pretty opinionated about a few things. Oh, and, yeah, Hans had his and, opinions. Uh, and, well, uh, he scared the water out of me on, on several occasions, but I think I finally got over it and got to know the man that held this place together for a lot of years. He did a lot of really good stuff. Hans did a lot of, a lot of work behind the scenes that people... And then I've been fortunate enough in my tenure here, in the five years that I've been here, to have you and Deanne volunteer to come out and help hang shows. Even you guys can be, we get them all placed, get them all lined up on the wall, and I look around and half of them are hung because you and Deanne have got such a partnership knowing how to make that happen. You can hang art. It goes back to the gallery days when we'd shifting things around a lot. but And we follow a lot of the format that, that has been set down, the predictables that have to be met, spacing and, sure. and so forth. And, and so it's all about preparation and going at it once you, once you establish something and sticking with it. But it's a very rewarding thing to, to be able to back up and look and see an exhibit that's well hung and, and well lighted. And, and that's and one thing we do get a lot of comments on is how well hung our shows are, how well hung and lit. and It's just a, a beautiful place, beautiful show. It just, I think anything that we can do to make the museum a more attractive place for people to and make them feel a part of it, and that seems to be it. We have such wonderful docents that we do. make everybody feel welcome and at ease. And I've been to quite a few museums over the years, and we, ours is a lot more hands-on in the sense that you can get right up close to and examine and talk about and look at with one-on-one with the docents, and, and a lot of museums are pretty, you just pay your fee and wander around and wonder how in the world this all came about. And, and I'll never forget, I was in the Gilcrease Museum one time, and of course, being a sculptor and a foundry person, I, there was a cape on a guy that was standing there, and I was really infatuated with this cape, and I thought, man, that thing's got to be hollow, and so I thumped it, and of course it had a little <laughs> ring to it, and immediately there was an intercom voice came on and said, do not do, touch the, yeah. uh, <laughs> do not touch the artwork, <coughs> and uh, no, well, well, I didn't know there was anybody in 10 miles of where we were, much less watching my every move, so yeah, there's, here it's more, you're welcome by a warm face and a smile, and uh, We're visiting today with our good friend Herman Walker on It's Art, Let's Talk About It, sponsored by the Museum of Western Art here in Kerrville, Texas. And, of course, the website for the museum is museumofwesternart.com and, of course, hermanwalker.com if you want to go out and look at some of Herman's work. Herman, let's talk about you've been in this game a long time. You've been playing this game of art a long time, and we deal with young people all the time. Any advice that you'd give to a young person getting into the arts? Actually, I have, I've had two different careers in arts. We were talking about the exciting things that happened in the mid-70s to the mid-80s. And unfortunately, in the late 80s, for whatever the reason may have been, crunch, whatever it was, but uh, the late 80s were really devastating to the art market. They were, they were really hard on the art market. I think in 1989, I had a gross sales for the entire year of $9,000. I had two kids in college, and I was faced with a career change. I had to do something else. I, the art just was not selling. And every time you went to a show, and it, this is a part for young people to understand that understanding your market and what's out there is a big part of the battle. And I know I would get in these arguments with myself to do a paint. An 8 by 10 or 11 by 14, will it sell at $500 or will it sell at $1,200? Yeah. And you found yourself boxed in by what you thought your potential market was, and that's never a good thing for a creative person. That's, you shouldn't have to work under that kind of stress, but it becomes a necessity when you are depending on it for a living, so that, and it's a big deal. So anyway, I went out of the art business in... I guess 90-something uh, I held on for another two or three years, but just had to get out of it. And in 2008, I, I got in the, started preconditioning cattle, and then I got into the construction business and started building. And in 2008, my wife 
retired from the bank she was working for, and we decided we'd get closer to the kids. And so we moved down here, and rather than trying to get back in the construction business, I decided I would just pick up the brushes and see what would happen. So I started painting again, and so that was my second career in art, basically. It started in 2008, which was, what, 15? 15 years ago yeah, now. Yeah, 15 years yeah. ago now. And uh, so it's been a, it's been it was just starting over as far as marketing is concerned. I had no contact or anything, just started fresh. And same subject, same person, the brushes, many of the brushes and the paint even had the oil paints left from back in the 80s. It just started over. And it's uh, to a young person, I would say that it's probably one of the hardest businesses to be successful in that you could do. But if you love it and you want to pursue it, then by all means go after it. But to understand it's it's a tough way to make a living. It is a tough way to make a living, that's for sure. And from a lot of areas, we've talked about on this radio show how it's the only profession in the world where all you have to say is I am and you are. You can be an artist. All you got to do is say I'm an artist. And But making a living at it is, is a different uh, that, That's a, a whole different, different ballgame. You seem to do a really good good job of marketing on the Internet today. A lot of your sales I see are come, you know, come from putting the images out there uh, on HermanWalker.com and, and through uh, Twitter and Facebook and I've been very successful in, in mostly through Facebook and Instagram, but I've been very successful in having, I've been very fortunate and blessed that I've had people that you know, I'll post something and they'll say. Well, and one of the things I have noticed is that when somebody comments on your work, you you respond. You answer almost every single comment that somebody places on your work. Even if they say, good job, Herman, you say, thank you, Bob, appreciate that. And it's very personal to you, isn't it? It is. I think that's probably one of the most important things you can do, especially if you're young and just starting out, is realize that when somebody speaks your name or gives you some kind of comment, that it is important, and they are important. And if you treat them like they are important, you get that you get that respect back. And it may be a 90, 90-year-old 90 little lady that will never, ever purchase anything that you've got and you understand that but if you give her the courtesy and the love that she has expressed to you then it all what goes around comes around that's a pretty good motto for life in general it is good so at heart the website is hermanwalker.com or you can look up herman walker artist and get to your works see works on the museum of western art website uh, go out and look at the catalog right now the three works that sold here at the uh, 40th mm -hmm. annual roundup, and uh, I assume you'll be in the 41st, 42nd, 43rd. I hope so. Just as long as it continues. As long as I can hold a brush. <laughs> <laughs> We've been visiting today with our good friend Herman Walker, Kerrville, Texas artist, HermanWalker.com, on its art. Let's talk about it. You can find more work by Herman and more about Herman on the Internet at HermanWalker.com and just by Googling his name. Or go out to the Museum of Western Art. Remember, we're open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. And by appointment, we'd love to have you here at the Museum of Western Art. And it's art. Let's talk about it. Herman, thanks for joining us today. Been my See, friend. it's not been as bad as you it's, thought it was. It's been as good. <laughs> Guy talks about art every day, all day, and he gets in front of a microphone and just can't do it. It's, it's been a lot of fun. We appreciate it. And thanks for joining us today on It's Art. Let's talk about it. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of It's Art, Let's Talk About It, a production of the Museum of Western Art in Kerrville, Texas. We hope you'll visit the museum in person. We're located at 1550 Bandera Highway in Kerrville, Texas. Find out more about us by going to www.museumofwesternart.com. And we hope you'll join us next time for It's Art, Let's Talk About It. The podcast is produced by the Texas Hill Country Podcast Network.